The Paul Leslie Hour, helping people tell their stories. And now, your host, Paul Leslie. Hey, it's me. Ladies and gentlemen, Ken Burns is joining us. I consider him an American treasure. As a documentary filmmaker, he's directed and produced some of the most talked about documentaries in history. He's covered some of the most quintessentially American topics from baseball to jazz, and now country music. It's entitled Country Music, a Florentine Films production. It's a documentary miniseries, eight parts. It has just debuted on PBS. Thank you, Ken, for joining us. Thanks for having me. Something that you would notice when you see this series, which I've enjoyed so much, is how intricate it seems to be. And you just, I watch it and I think, gosh, this must have been so much work. <laughs> well, it's eight, it represents eight and a half years of work. Um, the great blessing of being with public broadcasting, public media, is you have a chance to really do a deep dive into subjects. The, there's not really a business plan for this in, in the commercial networks. They would give us the money, but they wouldn't give us the time. And in this case, the time is our ally, and only public broadcasting has set a pick for us and permitted it to do this. You know, it represents not only all of those years, but handling 100,000 photographs and to distill the 3,300 that are in the final product to uh, have uh, more than 1,000 hours of footage to conduct 101 interviews, totaling more than 175 hours of interview time and whittling that down. All of that is this huge time-consuming process that together with the script, which is this intricately braided, interwoven document that undergoes literally two dozen kind of rewrites as, as we're working on it and learning more things, is for me a thrilling, thrilling process. And I'm now just happy that it started last night. We can air it you know, for, for everybody who has a chance to see it. What is it about country music that makes it so fascinating? Well, you know, I, you mentioned my subjects. You said quintessentially American, I think. You know, I've, every film that I've made, and it's pushing nearly 40 different films, and I count a film that's one hour as one, and I count a film like the Vietnam War that's 10 episodes and 18 hours as one. They've all been about the U.S., but they've also been about its lowercase, plural pronoun variation, us. So it's all the intimacy and warmth of us plus all of the breath and the majesty, the complexity, the contradiction, and even the controversy of the U.S. And that's the space I've existed in. And I think that country music is a subject that is firing on all cylinders in terms of all of that. And one of the things I've learned is that when you understand us, there's no them. It is often in the interest of politicians and people in our media culture to create divisions, to, to accentuate differences to point out red state, blue state, young, old, gay, straight, male, female, north, south, east, west, rich, poor, whatever it is you want to do. And we forget to select what we share in common. And that's what my work is interested in. It's not shying, it's not sugarcoating our past. It's not shying away from difficult things and the indignities that are ever present in human behavior. But it's also interested in the human spirit and the remarkable role this magnificent, but sometimes also dysfunctional republic seems to play in the positive progress of mankind. I couldn't have asked for a better subject than country music. And as you mentioned, 101 interviews, a very, very in-depth portrait of country music. Did you notice any commonalities amongst the participants, both the songwriters and the stars, the performers? Well, you know, on any subject like this, a big, big, deep dive, you know, a multi-episode series totaling 16, 16 and a half hours, you presume you're going to have a lot of experts, you're going to have a lot of scholars, you're going to have a lot of critics, you're going to have a, a lot of historians. We have one out of 101 interview. What was so striking is that everybody in the genre, the performers, and even people that we interviewed outside the genre, that is to say, Witten Marsalis from jazz and, and Paul Simon from uh, rock and, and folk and Elvis Costello from rock and Jack White and others, 
everybody knew the history of country music. And so it's very interesting that some of the youngest people we interviewed, Rhiannon Giddens and Catch Secor, are the people who populate our first episode, which is dealing with the, the story that is farthest away from us today until people like Merle Haggard, who's one of the 20 people who we interviewed that has passed away, or Willie Nelson, his own memory and own experience have caught up. I was really struck by that, that country music, like any art form, is propelling itself forward. It's never been one thing. It can't be easily pigeonholed as we like to do. And yet the people feel a kind of almost family obligation to know the family tree, a family obligation to know all the various members, to be able to name all the cousins and the second cousins once removed. It's a, it's a very beautiful thing uh, that I found. And, and that, I think, was the common thread. Everybody was willing to talk about themselves and what they'd done, but they were more willing to talk about the people that had preceded them. With that said, would you say that country music is mainstream? Well, I don't know what that means. I mean, there are times when country music has been hugely experimental. It's times when it's been marginalized. At its beginning, it didn't even know it existed. It was folk music. It was the expression of people. And it took mechanical reproduction, that is to say the phonograph, and the radio to disseminate it. There's times when it has been the dominant musical form in the United States, and right now it's huge. Other times when it's waned, as, the, as it did in the 50s and the early days of, of rock and roll, and country music was desperately trying to change its, its, its sound to sort of, of try to get some crossover pop appeal. And uh, so it's, it's always, it's a, it's a breathing thing. It's, a, it's got many diverse roots. It starts out with Jimmy Rogers, the, the, the music's first superstar, who's steeped in Southern Mississippi blues culture, African-American railroad workers, the men laying track. He was the water boy for them and soaked up a lot of this music. And he kind of represents the Saturday night in American culture and American music, not just limited to country. And on the other side, at the beginning, was the Carter family, and they were home and family and church, kind of the Sunday morning of things. But they also had an African-American mentor who collected songs with them and and gave them uh, melodies and songs he had learned in the black church experience and and from the blues. And so it starts off as more than one thing. And each one of those things is itself an amalgam, just like America, like an alloy, stronger because of its constituent parts. And then it goes on to sort of pursue cowboy music and uh, uh, Western swing and uh, all the various uh, permeations of string band music up and down Appalachia that eventually in one area becomes bluegrass, this kind of hybrid music within a music. It's got the Nashville sound, which is the attempt to try to have that pop crossover success. And then the reaction to it, which is the Bakersfield sound that's defiantly twangy and defiantly honky tonky. And uh, it's, a, it's a, just a wonderful story. So I don't think you can at ever one point say, it's mainstream. It certainly is right now. Countries, I mean, I live in rural New Hampshire. You spin the dial, you're more than likely to hit a country station. I'm right now speaking to you from New York City, where one of the most popular radio stations is a country station. So it's ubiquitous. It's nationwide and always has been. I mean, we talk about it as a southern and rural thing, but it's, you know, big cities like Chicago and Charlotte and Fort Worth and Dallas and and Shreveport, and particularly Nashville, along with Bakersfield and L.A., are all hugely important to the growth and development of country music. So to pigeonhole it is to isolate it and suggest it's kind of an island nation that you need to have a visa or a passport or some relaxed immigration, when in fact it abuts all the other great forms of American music, jazz and the blues and rhythm and blues and and country and rhythm and blues are the parents of rock. And so it touches rock and country and pop and gospel and rap and even classical music, all intertwined in this wonderful kind of mixture, this kind of gumbo, this stew of American music. Other than this idea that, you, as you were just saying, country music, oh, that's something that's only Southern. In, in the documentary, there are people from places like Michigan What other misconceptions do you think there are about country music? What maybe does the public get wrong? Well, I think, you know, Harlan Howard, the songwriter, said that country music was three chords and the truth. 
that's acknowledging that it doesn't have the kind of complexity and sophistication of some form of, of classical music and jazz, that it's very elemental musically, but those are really beautiful, beautiful melodies that it does have. But that other part, the truth, means that it's dealing with universal human themes. And we sometimes don't want to deal with those things. And we often, as we characterize or mischaracterize country music, we say it's about good old boys and pickup trucks and hound dogs and six packs of beer. And while there is a proud and honorable tradition, that's a small part of country music. What it deals with are two four-letter words that most of us would rather not deal with. And that's love and loss. And the songs that are sung by all the great country singers deal primarily with that. There's, you know, the joy of it. There's, you know, Hank Williams, he sings, uh, I got a hot rod Ford and a $2 bill and I know a place right over the hill. Talking about the sort of joy of new love. And he also says the silence of a shooting, a falling star lights up a purple sky. And as I wonder where you are, I'm so lonesome, I could cry. There's nobody that doesn't know that exuberance and that excitement and there's nobody that especially nobody that doesn't know the sadness of of being so lonely you could cry Hmm. it is just truly incredible poetry i saw on twitter you saying that i'm so lonesome i could cry was your favorite country song i'm curious what about the second favorite could you pick one? Well, I, I you know, it, 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 my favorite always, it's so impossible to do that. It's like saying, what's your favorite child? Uh, and you can't do that. So I love I'm So Lonesome, I Could Cry. I love Johnny Cash's I Still Miss Someone. It's very simple, like uh, the Hank Williams, I'm So Lonesome, I Could Cry. At my door, the leaves are falling. A cold, wild wind will come. Sweethearts walk by together, and I still miss someone. I go out on a party. And look for a little fun, but I find a corner because I still miss someone. I'll never get over the blue eyes. I see them everywhere. I miss her arms that held me when little Oak was there. I wonder if she's sorry for leaving what we'd begun. There's someone for me somewhere, but I still miss someone. Four simple verses, elegant, reduced, almost haiku like poetry welded together with a beautiful melody. Remember, art, music is the only art form that's invisible. That Wynton Marsala says that. If you marry that with the, the, the distillation of language, communication, that's poetry, you've got a delivery vehicle that goes right to the heart. Merle Haggard, who passed away after we had the great good fortune of interviewing, said it's about things that we believe in but have seen. Hmm. Was there a specific moment when you realized, okay, the next film, it's going to be about country music. Yeah. So we have, we overlap a lot of these projects. And so I, the last big film I finished uh, was in 2017 uh, with the Vietnam War, 10 parts, 18 hours. And last fall, we had a, just a two hour film on the history of the Mayo Clinic. But back in 2010, I had bumped into an old friend in in Dallas and he said, you know, you ever think about country music? And I had thought about it, but it went right to my heart right then. And that's what I um, uh, decided to do. So eight and a half years later, here it is. Now I have four different producing teams and that was done with one team. We had just were in the middle of uh, working on the Dust Bowl and that team then moved over to country music, just as the team that had done Prohibition moved on to the Vietnam War. And there are other projects going on and other teams that, that I work with. But yeah, no, we've, we've plowed ahead. Some folks have actually worked on it for that long, and it's been the only thing they've had to do. There was a part of the documentary that I found very interesting where they were talking about the inspiration or the fuel that fed the pen of Hank Williams. And they yeah. were saying that it was a, a divine inspiration. Yeah. It's a wonderful phrase. Somebody asked, this is Marty Stewart, who's the unofficial historian of uh, country music and himself, a virtuoso mandolin player who's played with Ricky Skaggs and Bill Monroe and and Johnny Cash. Those are his only, you know, three jobs in his life. And uh, he's a wonderful figure in our film. But he said, 
somebody had asked uh, Hank Williams, Hoss, how do you, how do you write all them sad songs? And he said, I don't, I just hold the pen and, and, and God writes them for me. And what Marty said is just priceless. He says, if you think about the creator, the, the person that made the sun and the moon and the stars, a two minute country song, isn't that hard? And I, I just love that. And in fact, most of Hank Williams, great ones just came out in 10 or 15 minutes. He wrote, Hey, good looking in less than 10 minutes. It's one of the great songs of all time. He was coming home late and trying to get into, uh, I think it's Birmingham or Montgomery, Alabama. And his mama said, there's, uh, there's the airport. I see the light. And he wrote, you know, I saw the light. It's just, it, it's just an amazing person, you know? Hmm. Well, what about you? Do, do you feel that there's a spiritual aspect to country music? Well, I think there is to art, and art is this transcendent thing that reconciles the dualities that we'd rather waste our times and our lives with. That's the binary system that wants to label everything in opposition. Why I say there's only us, no them. So I do believe it doesn't really matter what you call it, whether it's spiritual or it's what you get from art. Leo Tolstoy, the Russian writer, said that Art is the transfer of emotion from one person to another. I've always seen myself from my very first film as an emotional archaeologist, interested in not merely excavating the dry dates and facts and events of the past. Last time I checked, that's homework. But interested in the higher emotions, not nostalgia or sentimentality, but the higher emotions, which is almost like a glue that makes those dry shards uh, recollect into something in which you can feel the age that you're trying to make come alive, not just think about it and consider it from a kind of dry distance. And if that's spiritual, so be it. I do think that many of the people who appear in my films, not just country music and others, see some of these things as divine. And I'm perfectly willing to yield to higher powers. You know, we made our film in the national parks and uh, the first uh, episode was called The Scripture of Nature after something that John Muir had said. I'm willing to succumb to something that's bigger than me, whatever that might be. Speaking of emotions, I don't mind telling you, Ken, there were a few times watching this documentary that I was brought to tears. Did that ever happen to you? Oh, many, many times. And it's happened with the same scene 50 or 60 times. Uh, you know, the thing that's, I mean, this is a story that's about race. It's about strong women. It's about the tension between commerce and creativity. It's about songwriting and how that, that magical interior thing happens. It's about geographical distances. It's about class, people rising them up from stult, rising themselves up from stultifying poverty to create art that permits them to escape that poverty and permits others who may not be so lucky physically to be able to dream their way out in a way. But the thing that struck me more than anything else was just how emotional it was. I wasn't prepared after Vietnam, which I thought was about as emotional as you could get as a film, that this film would be even more so. And that's a testament to the art. I had a woman come up to me the other day who had seen an advanced copy of the whole thing. And she said, you know, that eighth episode, I had four good cries. It's a real cleanse. And I think it's cheaper than therapy. <laughs> I just thought that was wonderful. You know, uh, Charlie Pride in the very opening of the film and back in way back in episode one, what we played last night, he said, you know, there's a country. I believe there's a country song for every mood you're in. And it might make you cry, but you'll feel better for crying. <laughs> so, well, you know, come full circle 16 plus hours later. And it's true. Episode eight packs a wall up. As does, I think there's a, a cry in every single episode. But it's not because we're sitting there trying to play the violins or, or manipulate that. I think that good storytelling is going to touch the human experience. If the thing you're telling stories about is about this great art form. Was there a place that making this documentary brought you that you would say was the most country music centric place that you had been to? Well, you know, it's hard to, you know, beat Nashville, but we were in Bristol, Tennessee, where in the summer of 1927, August of 27, on the 1st of August, Ralph Peer uh, recorded for the very first time the Carter family, A.P. Sarah and 
Maybell, and then four days later on the fourth, recorded Jimmy Rogers. It's called The Big Bang. And being in Bristol, Tennessee, which is a wonderful town that sits astride the, the Tennessee Virginia border. In fact, you know, it's Main Street on, you know, you go to the center divider and one side is Virginia and the other side is is Tennessee. And it's just a wonderful place. And we've had the opportunity to spend a lot of time there studying and doing research. But, you know, we discover our topics everywhere from hundreds of archival sources. Those 100,000 photographs didn't just come from Nashville. Being in Nashville, being on the stage of the Ryman Auditorium, or now where the uh, Grand Ole Opry moved in the early 70s, way out of town to Opryland. These are very sacred places, walking on Music Row, where the publishers started to uh, spring up, and where Owen Bradley and Chet Atkins were competing and friendly producers turning out extraordinary hits over a couple of generations. All of that is, is quite powerful as it is just traveling the back roads of Appalachia or the Central Valley of California, where the Bakersfield sound emerged. These are all important places. But of course, the most important place, and I think it comes from your question before, is your own imagination, your own heart, and how these songs and how these stories fall on you. I mean, once you hear the story of how Dolly Parton wrote, I Will Always Love You, You know, Whitney Houston took that song and had huge crossover success with it. It was a mega hit. Her version is wonderful. It still raises the hair on the back of my neck. But once you understand Dolly's story, then hers rises to an even higher height. And I love that combination. This is not a, you know, a list of the KTEL records you should get or the Time Life series on country music you should get. This is actually a very complex interwoven story, almost like a Russian novel where it has dozens of primary and secondary and tertiary characters and a lot of bit players uh, strutting and fretting their hour across the stage. The combination of all of that with all of this wonderful music is, you know, what I do for a living. And I think I've got the best job in the country. What do you think country music says about America? Well, I think it tells us that it's built on the backs of working people, white and black, and that those people know that hard work is what life is about, and uh, sincerity and honesty are important. It also celebrates the rogue and the scamp, as well as the pious. It tells you that they know that it's not a level playing field, although that's the way we like to advertise ourselves to ourselves and to the rest of the world. And um, as we say in the introduction, this is the It tells the story of people who feel like their stories haven't been told. And I like that music. We are too much of a a celebrity-driven culture, an inside-the-beltway culture, and this is about real Americans, so-called ordinary people. And as soon as you get down into it, you realize there are no ordinary people. I think that's the meaning of country music. For more information... Visit KenBurns.com and for showtimes, PBS.org. I always like to let the guest just take the stage at the end. And this isn't just limited to country music. What would you like to say to our audience? Well, I'm very excited to share it. I I knew that people who are fans of country music would, would tune in. But I really made it for those people who say, well, I don't really know too much about it because I think you'll discover you know, a lot more than you think you do. And I also made it for those people who say, you know, oh, I don't like country music, which is sort of funny because you can't not like it once you've given it a chance. And so I'm, I have a good dear friend who came up to me and said, Ken, I've loved everything you've done, but I don't know about country music as if I'd stepped in a cow patty. But after he looked at all eight episodes, he was in a puddle sobbing and he spent the last year and a half trying to unnecessarily apologize to me, telling me, how much he loves it and telling me what he's downloaded this week and what he's listening to. And I I love the fervor and the enthusiasm of his conversion. And um, I'll hope that we can make everybody who has a chance and gives the series a chance to convert them too, if they aren't already big fans of country music. Ken, it's a great pleasure. Now I'm going to go watch the series. (laughs) Great. It's my pleasure, Paul. Thank you. All right. Until next time. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye-bye. The 
ba bi ba 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 do na ka chi ba lu ti ki za de gu zi ya te ka se ge ka la ka pi na se ge de bo che ke ye ki pa ki ka ka ti ka tu ka ki ti to ki pu pi la ka tu zi ka de le vang ga ka tu goodbye.